The 1300s have been described as a bad time for humanity. To say the least, this was a violent, tormented, bewildered, suffering and disintegrating age. England was embattled on two fronts with France in the Hundred Years' War from 1337 to 1453, and also with Scotland. Spain, for its part, turned from war with the Muslim Saracens, who were by now confined to Cadiz and Granada, toward dynastic struggles with two Christian kingdoms, Castile and Aragon. In Germany, the weakness of the Holy Roman Empire fostered a whole array of leagues and confederations. There were crop failures, famine, and declining trade. Christianity as a religion was torn in two by the so-called Babylonian captivity of the papacy from 1309 to 1377. That had to do with a succession of French popes under the domination of the monarchy who ruled from Avignon. Then came the so-called Great Schism from 1378 to 1417, in which there were actually two popes, one from Avignon, one from Rome. We should also take note of some prominent church reformers, including John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. The former declared a heretic and the latter executed. Society was racked by social upheaval, including urban riots in Barcelona, Rouen, Lübeck, Brunswick, Florence, and Flemish towns. Add to those rural revolts in Aragon, France, and Flanders, and an anti-poll tax revolt in England that failed. Overpopulation was another issue as the sheer numbers of mouths to feed outpaced agricultural advances. All the while, technology grew at a snail's pace. From the 11th through the 13th centuries, the fortunes of Western Christendom and the Jewish minority varied inversely. The growing power of national monarchies and the church, along with the urban Christian middle class brought isolation and poverty to the Jews. Calamities were invariably blamed on Jews. In Italy, the Franciscans, founded by the venerable Saint Francis of Assisi, spearheaded a religious and social onslaught against the Jews. We should also consider John of Capistrano from 1386 to 1456 known as the scourge of the Jews, who launched a preaching campaign against them. He was even granted inquisitorial powers and went on to obtain a cancellation of charters favoring Jews. He extended his efforts to Austria and Germany. In the meantime, Spanish and Portuguese Jewry went into steep decline during the 1300s. After the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain by the Christians, the Jews of the newly Christian Spain never equaled the accomplishments of their predecessors in the Golden Age. But they did serve Catholic kings and made their own scholarly contributions. They excelled in medicine, astronomy, and geography. During the 1300s, the Jews of Spain continued to be influenced by the current of mysticism which now revolved around its central work, the Zohar. The Zohar was substantial in size, consisting of several thick volumes amounting to a running commentary on the books of Moses. Its true authorship was still in question. The claim was made by the Spanish sage who circulated the book Moses Shem Tov de Leon, born in the year 1240, that he had only found it 
and that its real author was the ancient Israelite sage Shimon Bar Yochai. According to tradition, it was during the Roman period, after the destruction of the Second Temple, that Rabbi Shimon shamed the ruling authorities. The Romans decreed death for Bar Yochai, but he and his son hid themselves in a cave, living there for 12 years. Moses de Leon claimed that it was during that time that Bar Yochai wrote the Zohar. Only many centuries later was it transported to Spain, at which time it fell into the hands of Moses de Leon. Over time, the Jews of Spain were mesmerized by it, notwithstanding that after the death of Moses de Leon, his widow declared that it was all a colossal forgery. Nonetheless, the wonderstruck adherence of Kabbalah virtually went into denial about the prospect that the Zohar was a clever hoax. So persistent was the law surrounding the Zohar that attempts were made even into the 20th century to demonstrate that at least portions of it do indeed go back to the days of Shimon Bar Yochai. Unfortunately, people tend to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. The great modern scholar of Kabbalah, Gershom Sholem, investigated such theories only to conclude, based on the language and syntactical structure of the work, that it was written entirely by Moses de Leon. In the final analysis, Watson, faith must bow before the facts. But as to the message of the Zohar, we find a central theme that was compelling to many, that God in his mystical essence is both hidden and revealed in the text of the Torah. In the pages of the Zohar, we read the following. Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai said, Rabbi Simeon continued, Ta chaze, alma ilaa, the alma tataa, Baachad matkala it kalu, Israel la tata, umalachei ilalei la ela. Of course, messengers are needed, traveling back and forth between the two worlds, linking them and charging them with holy purpose. Mesha'ata de nachtin la tata, mit labshe bilvusha, de hayalma, ve ilav mit labshe bilvusha, kevgavna de hayalma, la yachlin la mekam, de hayalma, ve la savil. Lon Alma. Rabbi Simeon went on to say, The ad hisipor de oraita, levusha de oraita, la hu maan de hashiv, de hahu levusha, ihu oraita mamash, la mila achara, tipa ruhe, vala yahe le hulaka, balma da te. According to Kabbalah, as reflected in the Zohar, God interacts with the material world via a series of ten divine emanations, or sefirot, having to do with attributes of compassion and kindness balanced by severity. Throughout it all, we find images of the so-called sefirotic tree. The left side, of the sefirot structure is the side of power and strict justice. The values embodied in the sefirah of din or judgment. This is the female side representing the fearsome awe of God and the principles of separation and distinction. The unrestrained dominion of the left side gives rise to evil. The right side represents the principles of 
unity, harmony, and benevolence as embodied in the sefirah of chesed, or loving kindness. It's associated with bestowing generous goodness upon our world and is the masculine side. It might be argued that the mystical current was actually strongest during times of persecution. As people began to look higher to metaphysical realms as if to escape their suffering. And when it came to the Catholic Church in those days, there was plenty of suffering to mete out. Enter the leaders of Christian militancy, the Dominicans, founded in the year 1215 by Spanish theologian and preacher Domingo de Guzman, or Saint Dominic. Eventually, they ended up in conflict with the papacy. Pope Innocent III launched a crusade against them shortly afterward. And the papacy established a formal machinery of detection, supervision, and punishment of heresy. The Inquisition had been born. Not surprisingly, the Jews became prime targets as well. There were massacres in Sargossa, Barcelona, and other cities as the Black Death spread in Aragon in 1348. The attacks spread throughout Spain. In 1391, a mob in Seville attacked the Jewish quarter. Thousands were killed. The survivors who refused to be baptized were sold to the Muslims as slaves. The unrest spread to Cordoba and then Toledo. Thousands, tens of thousands of Jews were killed in 1391. An even greater number became conversos, official converts to Christianity. In 1415, Rabbi Solomon ibn Lachmish Alami declared, Evil has befallen us throughout the length and breadth of the provinces of Castile and in the kingdom of Catalonia in the year 1391. And for 22 years thereafter, those who were left in Castile were a parable and a byword, their situation becoming ever worse. They were required to change their garments, and various trades and crafts were denied to them. Those who lived comfortably in their homes were expelled from palaces of ease and delight, and all Jews dwelt in shacks, both in summer and winter, in shame and misery, for they had not learned crafts wherewith to make a living. And so it happened in the kingdom of Aragon, when a new king arose against them to enact new discriminations. By the middle third of the 15th century, a new generation of conversos penetrated the highest ranks of Spanish society, the court, the nobility, universities, and the church. But these so-called new Christians still carried a stigma, and they were given a new designation, maranos, or swine. It was said of the new Christians, they were Jews in all but name, Christians in nothing but form. They observed the Christian sacraments, baptism, confession, communion, but they also observed Shabbat and Pesach, synagogue services, and circumcision. The situation only worsened in 1413 to 1414 with the disputation of Tortosa. The Christians tried to prove that the Messiah had already come. The Jews stood firm. As a result, various decrees were introduced in Aragon, and many Jewish leaders had no choice but to convert. Following the marriage of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon in 1469, the two kingdoms were united. Ten years later, an anti-Jewish 
level of prejudice came to a head once again. The Dominican monk Tomás de Torquemada became royal confessor, pressing his campaign against heresy. In September 1480, two Dominicans were appointed inquisitors for Castile. An inquisitional tribunal began operating at Sevilla in January 1481. In 1487, Pope Innocent VIII gave him the title of Grand Inquisitor. His first act, an edict of grace, allowing heretics 30 days to confess their sins. Afterward, the names of those suspected of heresy were to be reported. His rules were clear. If you see your neighbors wearing clean and fancy clothes on Saturdays, if they clean their houses on Fridays and light candles earlier than usual on that night, if they eat unleavened bread and begin their meal with celery and lettuce during Holy Week, if they say prayers facing a wall, bowing back and forth, they are Jews. Those charged were arrested and encouraged to confess. If a confession was not given, torture would follow. Punishments ranged from spiritual penance to public humiliation, confiscation of property, whipping, forced labor in the galleys, or death reserved for those refusing to repent or whose confessions were deemed insincere. There would be a public procession and usually execution by fire, conducted by the secular authorities, as the Inquisition was reluctant to slay its own victims. Between 1481 and 1808, more than 300,000 were brought up on charges before the Inquisition. Of those, at least 30,000 were publicly executed. The targets, Muslims, Protestants, and other deviants, but mostly Maranos. Few professing Jews suffered directly at the hands of the inquisitors, who weren't really concerned with whether professing Jews practiced Judaism as long as they didn't interfere with Christians. But ecclesiastics such as Torquemada harbored serious anti-Semitism, holding them responsible for Judaizing, that is, proselytizing Christians. In 1483, the Jews were expelled from Andalusia. In January 1492, Granada fell to the Catholics. On March 31, 1492, at the urging of Torquemada, Ferdinand and Isabella signed an edict expelling all Jews except conversos from Spain. Jewish leaders offered a large bribe, 30,000 ducats. The king and queen might have accepted the offer, but Torquemada rushed in holding a crucifix aloft and declaring, Judas Iscariot sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Your Highness is about to sell him for 30,000 ducats. Here he is. Take him and sell him. But by May 1st, the edict was promulgated and an exodus of over 100,000 Jews followed. Legend has it that the date was the 9th of Av, the day both temples in Jerusalem were destroyed. By the end of July, not a single professing Jew was left in Spain. This was the greatest tragedy since the destruction of the temple in 70 of the Common Era. About 50,000 fled to Muslim countries and to Italy. Over 100,000 found their way to Portugal, only to meet forced conversion. Afterwards, they fanned out across Italy and the lands of Islam. Some went to Holland, where they created a society of their own. 
Increasing numbers of Jews settled in Western Slavic countries, Bohemia, Moravia, and Poland. Especially in Poland, the Jews found better economic and social conditions. The Spanish persecution also led to a revival of emigration to Israel. That included Maranos, laden with guilt, but they found only poverty and squalor in the holy city. The days of wandering were only beginning.